Thank you very much. This is really an honor for us to be here. We're really the newcomers to this organization or to this type of conference, and certainly uh, we feel this is an opportunity to tell our story. Um, as as um, Tom mentioned, I'm the general manager for the Border Environment Cooperation Commission, and we're a treaty organization. And I have a little bit of, a few of my slides are, are focused on what I call our BEC 101, because I always say, you know, we're the good news on the border. We don't deal with security. We don't deal with long wait times. We don't deal with human trafficking. We deal with environmental infrastructure. Um, oh, I didn't think I did this right. I'm sorry. Um, for those of you who don't know much about the border, um, the, our sister cities along the border are about 13 million residents. Um, and this is an area that is heavily influenced by migration, people moving from the south of Mexico to the north because of work, because of opportunity. Um, you've seen some of these statistics about trade going back and forth, but one of the things I do like to highlight is that in 2006, 250 million northbound crossings occurred and 95% of them were day trips. And what do we along the border recognize that? As shoppers. Shoppers that come from Mexico that shop in the United States. And it actually contributes to a 50 billion in taxable retail sales. Actually retail is the second largest employer on the U.S. side. Government's the first. The other thing that I also like to highlight is that there's 2,300 maquiladoras or manufacturing plants on the, on the U.S., on the Mexican side that 90% of them trace their origin to, to U.S. firms. Now one thing is important to also highlight is, is that some communities, for every 10 jobs that are generated in, on the Mexican side, it generates one to two jobs on the U.S. side. So again, that, that economic link is, 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 is interesting. And then the other thing that I also like to inform people, which I know you probably are very well aware, is that NAFTA did not take all of these companies down there. These companies were there since, since the 60s and 70s during the end of the Bracero program, and that actually resulted in a significant increase in population along the border. And what was the result was that you had many people without water, without sewer, and you'll see some of those statistics. What during the NAFTA hearings resulted was in the creation of two agencies, two treaty organizations, aside from other ones, which my colleague Evan Lloyd here is from the Commission for Environmental Cooperation. But ours only focuses on the border, and it's the Border Environment Cooperation Commission and the North American Development Bank, or the NAD Bank, as many of them know. What we focus is on developing environmental infrastructure that will prevent, control, reduce environmental pollutants um, for drinking water supply, flora, fauna, and protect human health. And we have a bank, a bank that's like a world bank with only two contributing countries, the United States and Mexico. So what have we done? Well, and this as an overview, our board are, are six federal agencies and four that represent the public, but we include Treasury, their Mexican counterpart, EPA, their Mexican counterpart, and Department of State. So we've got the money, the diplomats, and the environment all pulled together into a board that we try to balance their interests. Um, these are the areas that we work in, 100 kilometers north and 300 kilometers south, which is about a population of 30 million. And these are the sectors, water, air, um, and solid waste and energy as well. Our programs are in the area of grants. Um, we have grants for water, grants for construction. We have our, our, our sister agency, our bank has a NAD bank loan program. We also provide technical assistance and institutional capacity building, like I said, in the areas of water, waste, water, air quality, solid waste, and energy. This is what we've done in 15 years, and this is one of the things that I really like to, I've been with the organization uh, 13 of those 15 years that, since the organization really got off running, and so I've really seen the evolution of the organization, and we've actually certified 185 projects, which means our board has authorized for financing, um, 100 in the U.S. and 85 in Mexico, and that's about $4 billion worth of infrastructure. We've benefited 13 million of the population, so if you're talking about a population of about 30 million, we've been in almost half the communities, and our bank has financed most of that, 148. Uh, projects with $1.5 billion worth of financing, which has built about $4 billion worth of infrastructure. So our leveraging is about three to one. And this is just really quickly how it's divided amongst the states. Um, and then the other um, program that we like to also uh, promote is 
technical assistance, how planning dollars have been critical for the development of this infrastructure. We've actually provided about $40 million worth of technical assistance. Of that $40 million, 85% of the funds have gone to implemented projects. And then again, every year we have a series of trainings as well. Um, at the operational level, we've, got, we've done quite a bit of work in methane to markets, in climate action planning, which I'll, I'll spend most of my presentation on, on carbon markets and on energy efficiency. And as many of you know, the utilities, tend, water and wastewater utilities are your largest single energy consumer in just about every community. Um, these are the social benefits. Uh, in, we've done 89 water and wastewater projects. Again, a lot of our part work has been in water. Um, the wastewater component of it has actually eliminated 4 million gallons per day of raw sewage that used to flow into shared water bodies. So again, protecting that water supply is an important topic for both governments. Um, 25 water conservation projects of annual water savings of 330 million gallons per day. 17 solid waste projects um, which have built 16 landfills that dispose of 1,550 tons of waste per day, 13 air quality projects, which have mostly been paving, which have actually eliminated 200,000 tons per year of PM10, and four energy projects, which is really a growing sector for us, have avoided nearly 668,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And for those that don't think that infrastructure generates jobs, we actually did the study uh, on, on communities along the U.S. border. What is the job generation when it comes with building infrastructure? For every, dollar, for every million dollars that you invest in water and wastewater over 10 years, you actually generate 220 new jobs and 52.2 million in goods produced by the private sector. And so I always highlight the fact that when you put in infrastructure for the first time, what do you start getting? You get your family dollar, your car wash, your laundromat, and your strip malls. And so that's what starts to generate jobs in the local communities. For those, I'm an engineer, uh, and for those, of, and I do a lot of presentations to engineers, and they like to see what we've built. And so it's 20 drinking water treatment plants, 32 drinking water systems, 54 wastewater treatment plants, 73 wastewater collection systems, 16 landfills, 16 dump sites closed, and almost um, 27 million uh, square meters of pavement. Our pipeline typically is still in the solid waste, air quality, energy, and water is about 57 projects, $1.4 billion worth of infrastructure. You can see there across the states how it's divided up. Um, our biggest, our big, and I, this is our water and wastewater. You saw many of our projects on our water and wastewater. And our, and our biggest advocate is EPA and CONAGUA precisely. Um, we have actually funded uh, through EPA and CONAGUA about $1.7 billion worth of infrastructure, where EPA put in about $556 million and Conagua put in the remainder. It has been a, an, a, an, a significant model for cooperation. Now, within the, the, these, this, these projects, in the last two years, we've actually implemented a green building guidelines that go along with the development of these projects. And those green building guidelines take into account the use of materials, take into account opportunities for taking rainwater, not having, uh, imper having impermeable sources, natural sources, low energy, and all of our project sponsors are now responsible for using those in the project development. And it's, it's actually starting to look at green building from the planning phase, because if you start looking at it at the at design, it's too late. You actually start, start how you site, how you move your earth, all of that is still looked at early on. Um, this is a really important statistic for Mexico. Um, these are uh, communities in Mexico only right immediately along the border in, and you can't really see that, see that here, but in 1995 only 89% of the population had water, 64 had sewer, and 20% had wastewater treatment. Because of this program, um, these states now have 96% water, 88% uh, sewer and 82% wastewater coverage. The rest of Mexico is still at 40%. So this work is obviously very important because most of the discharge points were going into shared water bodies between the two countries. The other program, which is also a model, um, is that when two governments get together and they make up their mind about what they want to do, it, it's really impactful. And in the case of, of, of Semarnat and EPA, they came together and said, these are goals that we're sending, setting under our Border 2012 program. Um, these are the six goals and in it with their sub-goals. And outside of the room, I have more information on these programs, but actually, 
it's really interesting because they've achieved about 80% of these goals. They're going through a process right now of, of updating their goals to border 2020. And their number one goal is climate change. And right now they're in the process of, of developing those sub goals. And what the BEC does for them is, is that we handle the, the logistics because there, there are work groups. And again, it's a, it's a bottoms up approach. And that's one of the things that I like to highlight a lot is, is that, and I think there was a conference called, um, Think um, act global. Uh, think what is it? Act lo locally. Think globally, right? That we locally have to do a lot of this work associated with that. And this model um, uses regional work groups, mayors, uh, county people, um, local legislators to tell us what's important to them in these goals. And then there's policy forums that bring experts to these people to teach them at the local level as to how you can best achieve these goals. So all of this that we've done in the 15 years has actually given us a lot of credibility with both sides of the border, especially the, with the 10 Mexican border states. And we have actually been working with them on promoting sound public policies through assisting them in climate change, needs assessments, and sustainable housing. Um, so on the U.S. side, as many of you know, um, climate action plans have been done on, on the border states in California, Arizona, and New Mexico. The United, the Mexico as a government has actually set goals for GHG emission reductions. And so not only can we congratulate them on the water accomplishments, but them as a country are leading developing nations in working towards emission reductions. And so what we're doing, the BEC, since our area of jurisdiction is only the six Mexican border states, we actually did um, uh, greenhouse gas inventories for the six Mexican border states using a methodology that's applicable to both countries. And so as you can see here on the bottom, we've got the Mexican northern states. We have Baja California, Sonora, Chihuahua, Coahuila, Nuevo León, and Tamaulipas. And up, up here, we've got where the GHG emissions are coming. As you can see, electricity consumption is one of the largest emitters. Now, if water and utilities are, are, are some of the largest consumers, it's only natural to assume that you're going to be working in emission reduction efforts in the water area. And the other one that I'd like to highlight here is transportation. Um, transportation are significant emitters as well. In, in certain states, we've got a lot of mining, which is these industrial processes. And then on top, we've got um, waste management and agriculture. So what have we done with those GHG inventories? We've actually started working with three Mexican border states on their climate action plans. And a couple of things that are worth highlighting here is that the, the GHG emissions um, right now for Mexico in the six Mexican border states generate 22% of the national emissions with only 17.6% of the total population. Uh, by 2025, we're, it's projected if tendencies stay the same to actually generate 31% of the national GHG emissions with only 20% of the population. So what you start to see is, is that the focus on the border states is very important from a climate action planning process. Now what the Mexican government has communicated to us is that them as a country are working towards getting climate action plans for their 32 states. And right now they only have three. And so what the work that we're doing is obviously supporting the, the, the work of the, of the Mexican government in getting the climate action plans. The interesting thing is that we started in three of the states, in Baja California, Sonora, and Coahuila, and we came up with 134 mitigation policies um, across all three states. 43 of them start to be replicated. And so you start to see tendencies of where states are going in developing programs. And here you see energy efficiency programs, public buildings, and this energy efficiency programs is really focused on water. Um, and also public buildings and street lighting. Um, incentives for the development of alternative energies, public transport modernization, lay, uh, urban light rail systems, traffic control infrastructure, vehicle verifications, programs and methane, to, and methane management. Again, targeting those sector, sectors of energy, transportation, and methane. These are just some sample projects that could be used to, um, that, that could be funded by our organization for reduction of, of, of emissions, which are in the clean and renewable energy, the waste to energy, the energy efficiencies, and obviously in the water sector. Um, one of the other uh, 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 efforts that we did in, in developing good public policies is looking at what investment needs were 100 kilometers north and 300 kilometers south on the, on the U.S. and Mexico. And as we can see, on the U.S., we're still looking 
at about $8.5 billion worth of investment needs for first-time service, for people that are not connected to centralized systems. Um, this is not rehabilitation at all. And then in the case of Mexico, it's about $1.5 billion worth of needs. So actually there's more needs in the U.S. than in Mexico from a cost perspective, but not necessarily from a population perspective. Um, recently, we just finished a study um, with the World Bank on the development of operation and management indicators for water utilities. Um, COLEF, which is a, a university that focuses on the U.S.-Mexico border on the Mexican side, actually uh, did this. And we actually looked, we did a comparison of the Mexican border region utilities. And Dr. Arraguin hasn't seen this because we just finished <laughs> it. So uh, obviously we'll be, we'll be coordinating with him on the results of this. But it basically, it's a study that looked at 96 performance indicators related to cost and finance technical, operational, consumption, production, coverage, and non-build water. And there's one that I really want to highlight, and that's this one, which we're calling uh, global efficiencies. Global efficiencies look at, looks at water distributed and water build. And so as you can see, you know, for instance, we have in some communities, that they're, they're down in the 35 to 34 percent level. That means they're paying very little of their water and they're losing a lot of their water. Um, you want to kind of be in the 75 to 80% range. We do have some utilities that are in there. So these start to be indicators for us as far as energy, as far as revenues to sustain any improvements that need to be done. Um, and so we're envisioning taking this to the next level and looking at opportunities for energy efficiencies in these utilities. And finally, the last slide that I have here, and actually I have a fact sheet outside about is, a, is the concept of green housing. And I know this is a water panel, but one of the things that really struck me when I went to Cancun to the COP is, is when Mexico's president said 25% of homes in Mexico have been built in the last 10 years. And so what you're seeing is, is that the growth of Mexico and the move towards putting in housing is obviously going to be very important in being able to um, make sure that it's done sustainably because there, it's going to be resource intensive. And so what we did is that we actually developed a document that looks at 72 indicators for green housing. The first 26 are no cost indicators. The second 26 are, are a 10% uh, increase in the homes of indicators. And we actually, and then the final are a 25% increase in the cost of the home. So we're actually, we actually worked, we have our first implementation of this policy in Sonora. Actually, Sonora just passed a law associated with, with how they're zoning and developing um, these new, new um, because you, it, for those of you who go to Mexico, you can go and you can see, I mean, it looks like a whole row of condos, right, built one, right, one next to the other. And so what you want to do is take into account as many sustainability factors. And we actually quantified the energy reduction, the greenhouse gas reductions that would come or would be saved by using every single one of these indicators. 